Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie is a Nigerian writer uh, known for her literature that focuses on post-colonial thought, an award-winning writer with books like Purple Hibiscus, Half of a Yellow Sun, and Americana. I encourage you to look her up. Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. She is also well known for a TED Talk entitled The Danger of a Single Story. And she talks, for example, about first arriving in the United States and meeting her college roommate who asks, what is your favorite tribal music and Chimamanda responds, Mariah Carey. <laughs> Adichie argues that single stories originate from a lack of knowledge of others. And if we are not careful, our single stories of each other will fester into malicious intent to suppress other groups, and prejudice naturally follows. Chimamanda Adichie believes that we all, especially in our childhood, are impressionable, vulnerable to stories especially vulnerable to a single story that stays in our heads and our hearts the rest of our life. Adichie is also someone who believes that Western media and literature often only tell one story, which causes people to generalize, make assumptions about others. And I think it's important for us to learn from Chimamanda Adichie to resist single stories. And I think this is a natural segue to our gospel today. The gospel of Mark is akin to the wisdom of Adichie in which both Mark and Adichie use stylistic devices in their storytelling. And one stylistic device in particular comes to mind, and it's one in which you sandwich two stories together. It's a way in which a writer can show the meaning of stories by the reference point of the other one. And it's important for Mark to do this in the particular gospel lesson we have today. Mark, known as John Mark, is one of the gospel writers who is akin to a journalist. And the way he tells stories is the way a journalist would tell stories. And he's always using active verbs He's always trying to get us to see something that is hard to see. He is in the media business, but John Mark is not trying to tell a single story. He wants us, wants the audience. He wants us even in the mystical way in which these gospel writers, wants us 2,000 years later to know the truth. Mark forces us to think about how stories relate to one another. And so, in our gospel lesson, we have two female stories, two stories whose women, one a woman, one a child, relate but not in the same social positions. They are radically different. One is affluent, 
One is dirt poor. In our gospel lesson, these two women do have a common thread. They both are seeking healing. The first story that Mark tells is about a 12-year-old girl at the point of death. She's named as the daughter of Jairus, one of the leaders of the synagogue. And she was affluent because the leaders of the synagogues were affluent of means. And she, being 12 years old, was just on the edge of puberty. Now, in contrast, the second story is about a woman who suffered from hemorrhaging for 12 years. Keep in mind, a 12-year-old daughter of Jairus, and keep in mind a woman who is hemorrhaging for 12 years. And most likely, this woman was permanently infertile. No doubt, the number 12 for Mark symbolizes the key to the social meaning of how the stories are related. The number 12 has the symbolism of community, of community that could also be diverse and still be community. The 12 tribes of Israel, diverse and yet supposed to be unified. The number 12 Mark is using as a literary device as well. So the woman who is dirt poor is an outcast. And as she is an outcast, she inevitably, when she knows the single story of Jesus, is reminded that she should not be an outcast. Her single story of Jesus was one in which she knew that Jesus was someone who broke open stories. The way that Jesus' life was being presented in this first century world is one in which Jesus was, I, was an iconoclast. He destroyed the stereotype. Jesus' single story was to bring down the stereotypes of others. Seemingly only when the outcast woman is restored to true daughterhood can the daughter of the synagogue be restored to true life. The daughter, the daughter of Jairus, and as we will see, the daughter of Jesus come together in these two stories. Growing up, my friends used to worry about catching cooties. I don't know, is that still said today, cooties? Well, when I grew up in Raleigh, North Carolina, in the public school system, my friends were afraid to catch cooties. No one knew what they, what they were. <laughs> they were just afraid to catch them. It became obvious that it was the disadvantaged kids who had cooties. It became obvious that the kids on the lower rankings of hierarch hierarchical <coughs> socioeconomic status were the ones who had cooties. It became obvious that the despised groups were described with the cooties. The New Testament scholar Chad Myers puts it this way, we grant some people access to health care, education, housing, and food, while others go without and allow some to suffer while others prosper. In many circumstances, he continues in human history, 
We hear stories about how the marginalized are forced to live alone and become unapproachable, stigmatized as unclean. Chad Myers is right. We've been doing this cooties thing for over 2,000 years. And the woman with a hemorrhage is no exception. The woman with a he hemorrhage in Mark is not given a name, mind you. Mark recounts having spent all her money on doctors. She is now destitute and rendered ritually unclean. She cannot have a place in a synagogue. She cannot go out in public. She cannot worship with each other. Family and friends avoid touching her, and anything associated with her are unclean. Just by being in the crowd, she is violating all kinds of rules and regulations. The woman with the hemorrhage is hard to imagine as anyone more marginalized than her. In contrast, Jesus encounters this unnamed woman. In contrast, when he comes into her presence, she is no longer someone with Cooties. In contrast, when Jesus meets her, he is meeting a human being and a beloved daughter. And knowing this as language is 90% nonverbal, knowing this without even hearing Jesus speak, the woman with the hemorrhage seeks Jesus out, touch touches his clothes. She steps out of the crowd in an act of faith. The movement alone is salvific. Just her movement out of the crowd is salvific without any need for any mysterious power. Jesus says as much is your faith that is healing you. The unnamed woman steps out of the crowd and is named by Jesus. Daughter, he says. The other story, Jairus approaches Jesus from the front. The woman with the hemorrhage approaches Jesus from the back. Jairus approaches Jesus from the front, pleading his request. The anonymous girl, his daughter, is sick, needs healing. And indeed, Jairus' daughter seems lost in the story because the focus up until now in Mark's gospel has been on the woman with the hemorrhage. Strange, isn't it, that the focus is not on the affluent family, not on Jairus. Strange how when Jesus shows up, there's a rearrangement of focus. When Jesus shows up, there's a, a, another narrative. When Jesus shows up, he renames those who are unnamed. But what's beautiful about Jesus is that there is no zero-sum game here. He heals Jairus' daughter just like he healed the woman with the hemorrhage. And here is the punchline for the sandwiched stories. The two stories of the woman with the hemorrhage now named Jesus' daughter and Jairus' daughter. The punchline for both of these stories is that while the little girl is Jairus' daughter, Jesus identifies the unclean woman as Jesus' daughter. 
Jesus tells the woman as much, daughter, your faith has made you well. And so these two stories come together. The story of Jairus and his daughter provide a start and a finish which the unnamed woman is now also a daughter. One of my favorite early theologians, John Chrysostom, writes, Do you see? Do you see? Do you see how the woman is superior to the ruler of the synagogue? John of Chrysostom says, Do you see the power of this woman? She did not detain Jesus. She did not even speak to Jesus. She didn't come with a Santa Claus list of things she wanted. She simply touched Jesus with the end of her fingers. And though she came later, she came from behind, she came in a clandestine way, she became the first not the last. Both stories are about, are about being cured, about breaking down a single story of the other. And so Jesus, in our midst, is saying the same to us, calling us daughters, calling us sons, saying to us, be disruptive of the single stories out there as soon as you leave this church building. Do not see the stranger in a way in which they are imprisoned by what they look like, sound like, smell like, Jesus is saying to us through these two stories, bring together your own identity, your own social location with those who are different from you.